In the food systems, biotech GMOs, two early success stories. The first two traits that were introduced into agriculture via biotech, and traits refers to just a, a property to give, you know, uh, disease resistance, insect resistance, non <coughs> apple, what have you. The first two were BT corn. I think BT corn came before Roundup Ready. BT is a trait that confers insect resistance on any plant that it's introduced into. So it's what they did was they took these proteins that are produced by Bacillus thuringiensis, it's a soil bacteria that uh, kills types of insects that eat corn and cotton or the main two crops. So the uh, caterpillar, the corn borer, the weevil, eat, starts eating the plant, the protein goes into their gut, explodes their gut, plant, the insect dies, the plant continues to live. No need to apply uh, insecticides. This bacteria, Bt has been used in organic farming for decades. It's a completely safe to humans and mammals. The result in corn, you can see here, it's continued. There's been some resistance and it's popped back up. It's been about level. Insecticide use is reduced tenfold. It was 10, now it's at a 1, um, as the Bt trait was taken out. And then the, the, I should have said, I think these are two, and you start talking about GMOs, a lot of people go, oh, I think GMOs can be useful, but I'm not crazy about them being used to, you know, put insecticides in food, and I'm not crazy about the idea of, you know, breeding plants so you can spray more um, herbicides on them. And advocates of biotech get defensive, and sometimes they try to change the subject, they start having a hard. I say no, go right in. These are the two most impactful innovations in agriculture in the last 30 years. 90% decrease in insecticide use in corn. It's similar in cotton. And that's, and we're gonna get to this. Corn is grown on 90 million acres in the US. I forget what cotton is, because I mostly look at food. Cotton's gotta be 30, 20, 30 million, 15, I don't know. It's a lot, it's a big footprint. So that's huge. Um, the second trait was Roundup resistance, herbicide tolerance. This allows you to spray the herbicide on the plant, the crop, the weeds die, the crop doesn't, the crop thrives. Weed control is the number one problem for all farmers. It's their biggest resource. And weeds steal resources from the crops. This is one of the things that people who aren't involved in agriculture don't really get at a gut level. If you're watering a field, and you have weeds, and if it's irrigated water, that water is precious, right? That water is going into a weed that confers no value. If you're fertilizing your field with nitrogen, potassium, uh, phosphorus, and the weeds are sucking that up, those are precious resources that are going into weed. The, the tractor pass, using all that fuel, all gone, eaten up by these weeds. So there's that. The other thing, other thing to understand is Roundup, the reason why Roundup was chosen is it's the least impactful, least toxic herbicide out of the whole toolkit. 
which is why it was like, we could use that instead of these other five that will lower our environmental impacts. So you don't get the massive decrease in herbicide use that you saw in insecticide use. This is pounds per acre, and in soybeans it's gone up. But it's swapping out with different herbicides, so you can see the relative toxicity dropping and then stabilizing. That's big. And again, corn, 90 million acres. Soybeans, 60 million acres. It's massive. Organic farming. Anybody want to guess if corn is 90 million and soybeans conventional are 60 million? Anybody want to guess how many million acres of organic farming is happening in the US? Less than, less than one. It's two and a half million. <laughs> it's tiny. So you can, like, we'll get to that. Um, the other thing that herbicide tolerant crops allowed was a practice called uh, no-till and conventional tillage, which means one way of controlling weeds is to plow your field, break up that growth cycle. If you don't have to do that, you can leave your soil structure intact. You tillage does a number of things. One, you try the soil carbon, nit reactive nitrogen are released as greenhouse gases. We don't think of that as pollution. To till a field, who would think of that as pollution? Just plow on the field. But it is, if you're worried about global warming. It cuts down on erosion, it keeps the uh, old water better, so it lowers your irrigation costs. It does, it's, it's again, one of the most impactful innovations in agriculture in the last 30 years. When you're talking about farming, you're talking about this. If you're talking about making farming sustainable, you're talking about this, by and large. Um, frustratingly, like, there's been uh, a BT potato for like a decade or more that would allow you to grow potatoes without insecticides or much less insecticides. To do that, you need, what do you need on your side? In McDonald's. McDonald's wouldn't do it because they didn't want to have the discussion with their customers. They're, and it takes a lot of insecticides to grow potatoes because potatoes don't rotate well with other crops. They just grow like main I know, they grow potatoes. Nothing else grows there, you start with potatoes. So you can't break up the pest cycle by just moving in another crop. So they just spray them with a lot of insecticides. It was easier for McDonald's to keep selling, and I don't want to, insecticide use is very safe for the consumer. Maybe not for local communities, farm workers. I don't want to fear monger about insecticides and potatoes, but it was easier to just keep using insecticides on potatoes, one of the highest insecticide use, and to have a conversation with their customers and say, hey, we can use a lot less insecticides in your french fries with these biotech potatoes. But it was too difficult a conversation because of all the fear mongering. Want to watch a crop breeding? This is like getting the on base average up. Watch for biofortification, adding, you know, making it more nutritious, adding beta carotene, zinc iron. And the famous one is golden rice, where they're putting beta carotene, the precursor to vitamin A, in rice, so it can be uh, easily grown in areas that are deficient. Uh, in, they have huge problems with vitamin A deficiency, and children go blind. It's also a problem in Uganda. Uganda. The government is funding a uh, 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 golden banana, beta carotene, and rich banana. That's a staple crop there. That's one thing I meant to, it's protein's stable crop. I mean, I didn't make it explicit, stable crops. So 
not always weak, but wherever you are, stand across what you want to watch. Um, drug tolerance, disease resistance. This is the big one, um, especially for people who like to eat and drink well. Because the crops that are most vulnerable to the disease are the ones you can't swallow. Like the disease comes, okay, we'll plant something else. It doesn't work with an orange growth, apple orchard, banana plantation, cacao growth, coffee grove, uh, a great vineyard, right? So uh, the blight comes in, the will comes in, the rust comes in. You're screwed. And then um, those are also tend to be uh, genetically identical plants. So they're also that's also you know every Cavendish banana is exact. The DNA is exactly the same. We don't have any other commercially viable bananas to switch to. Um, so if you like. Apples, oranges, orange juice, wine, bananas, <laughs> uh, chocolate, good coffee. Disease resistance is going to be a big deal. The big swing for the fences is the speculative stuff. They or may not get there. It may just be too hard. Um, nitrogen fixation. Again, that's right. Like, plants that fix their own, fix their own nitrogen don't really fix their own nitrogen. They have a symbiotic relationship with soil bacteria in their uh, roots, their root nodules, where they do this trade. And again, I understand, but not well enough to explain it to other people. Um, that's gonna be a tough nut to crack. If we do, that's the whole, you know, this lecture probably References like six different holy grails. Um, so it's a polytheistic religion that <laughs> uh, also uses grails to drink from. Uh, nitrogen fixation is huge. Speeding up photosynthesis is another massive move. Yield is how much biomass can you create in a certain amount of space. One way to do it is just to get it to go faster. And you, like, maybe you can get two crops in while the sun is out, right? Um, if you, instead of six months, you get it done in three months. Or, so you get it from six months to three and a half months, and you kind of have two shitty half months on either end. <laughs> two crops are better than one. Rubisco, again. This is like the first step in photosynthesis. I understand it well enough, but not to explain to you. <laughs> Improved albedo. This is a little esoteric. Um, Lights of global warming. Albedo is the term we refer to uh, the Earth's reflective power. So, sun comes in, we reflect it back, that's warming, instead of absorbing that energy. There are breeders working on getting the leaves to tilt and follow the sun. Oh, oh that one way to speed up photosynthesis is to, uh, I read about this the other day, really fascinating, is there's a, like, the plants react to the sun. Cloud comes by, they shut down. Cloud goes away, it takes them 45 minutes, an hour, an hour, an hour, to kind of get back up to speed. They're working on just cutting that down. Um, improved albedo. Can you change the tint of the leaves? Can you change the angle of the leaves or how they fall in the sun to reflect? Now, that, this, here's a problem with my criteria. This doesn't solve an economic problem for anybody. So it's technologically really hard not to crack and then there's no commercial application. Um, but it might be something that governments do in planting park, you know, trees and parks. You know, who knows? I mean, you're never going to get me to argue against basic research. You just kind of, at one level, we just got to keep throwing stuff against the wall.
Thank you.